Hello and welcome back to the What The Fork Sunland Preview Show. Just when everything seemed a little bit rosy in the Sunland Garden, the lads forget how to play football, get done thanks to a Chris McGuire hat trick off Lincoln, and the importance of three points this weekend becomes even more important. That's right, we're in the second half of the season where every point and every win becomes precious, and next up is Accrington and Stanley at the Wham Stadium. And to talk us through Stanley's season so far is a returning guest, I believe his fourth appearance on the show, I could be wrong. It's across the pitch co-host Tony. Tony, how are you doing? Are you all right? I'm doing, I'm doing well, Graham. I appreciate uh, being on with you again, and it's always a, a pleasure uh, to talk some football with you, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking about the upcoming match. So It's always good to, it, it's always good to have a returning guest because it feels like you're having to catch up, and I feel like asking how your family is before anything else. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, it is, it, it is because, uh, you know, I follow you guys on Twitter, and uh, so I always... Uh, it's it's sort of nice to have a, a chat and like you say it's like a visit as opposed to an interview and I think that's one of the things that we try to do on our podcast Graham is that uh, we don't interview the player players or our guests we we just have a visit with them and and get some good stories out of them and and uh, a relaxed atmosphere and I think that's where you get your best results fingers crossed I'll let, the, I'll let the viewers decide on or the viewers the listeners decide for me on that one but fingers crossed there's a, a few subscribers so I'm doing something right um we'll start straight from the top obviously recent forms actually been quite impressive you've only conceded one goal in the last four you've beaten league leaders Rotherham which is no mean feat drew with MK Dons with 10 men and you've beaten Bolton who are a pretty handy side although they are a little bit up and down with their form but what's your your view on Accrington's most recent performances well, I think the the big thing is Graham is that they've tightened up defensively. They um, they had that bel- bad stretch in um, in November where they were conceding goals. Every mistake just was magnified and was ended up in the back of the net. Um, they went from went to reverted back to a back four uh, just to get that uh, defensive uh, position back in the play, and and they really stopped a lot of their uh, forwards going. F- you know, moving forward and joining the play. And and I, I think that got them more disciplined and uh, they've started to, you don't see them wandering up as much. And and it's as a result, you've seen a lot of, you've seen the clean sheets. And and the one time our wing back, or I should say the fullback, because he's playing more of a fullback, uh, Clark got out of position and uh, got burned against MK Dons. And that was just really a sort of a, a, a the one mistake they made and they got punished. So, and that seems to be our season is that when we do make, make a mistake, it uh, ends up in the back of the net. But defensively, they've, they've, they've shored things up and uh, they've even reverted to going to a, a three at the back uh, recently, even during their, uh, their present form, uh, because I think they've got that defensive discipline back. And then they started to be able to go back to what they wanted to do at the start of the season. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's turned around. They're playing well. I think, against MK Dons. Um, it, it's unfortunate the player was sent off because it was right at the 30 minute mark. Uh, I, you know, a harsh call as far as I'm concerned. It was a, you know, maybe a, a yellow and a stern warning. But when you go against MK Dons who like to play possession football, it really puts you behind the, behind the ball, so to speak. Uh, and I think we only had 19% possession. And the second half, it was... Uh, you know, everybody, everybody in the, the all hands on deck, so to speak. Um, but they played, they played well. And unfortunately, uh, NK Dons, as I say, they like to play that. They like to pass it uh, back to, from the wing backs to the center backs and, and around the edges. And they never really threatened uh, Stanley in the second half, even though they had all the possession, because defensively, uh, uh, Accrington kept their shape. And uh, I think a 1-1 one, one was a fair result for that match. The match against Rotherham, I think we played probably the best that play, we played all season. And um, and it was fitting that Sean McConville scored with a really uh, overhead kick. And it was to cele- it was celebrating John Coleman and Jimmy Bell 20 years at Accrington Stanley, which uh, in itself is a feat. And you just don't see that. And you won't see that probably for a long time. Um, and for for them to beat the top of the league and to score one nothing win, which is a Stanley typical Stanley win, I think that was uh, uh, that was a highlight of the season. But it's carried on, and um, 
Yeah, I think I think we're uh, we're we got we're playing with confidence now, and and that's what was lacking before. Obviously, three of those four results have came at home, and you're touching on Rotherham there, and I think not just beating Rotherham, stopping them from scoring because they are they they I mean they've beat us five one. They've beaten a few teams by quite a few goals, They're not the kind of team that just gets one and win. Yet they went to Accrington and didn't get any. But your your home form's actually been really strong. I think last season was. Yes, you had more wins at home, but it was much of a muchness away from home form. Like the mid-table team, which is kind of where you ended up last season, was about the same across the board, home and away. This season, you've you've won seven, you've drew two, and you've lost four at home. Is the Wham Stadium becoming a bit more of a, a fortress this season? Yeah, I think I think it is, uh, and that's because I think John, John and Jimmy have got them, uh, you know, playing, and they know if they if they can get into the game and, and show some urgency uh, the early part of the get the fans behind them and and it really does make a difference uh, in a small stadium when you get the Accrington fans uh chanting and and supporting and and being like a 12th man uh and they did that against like I, well not a, it's every match they do that but it, it seemed to be really special against Rotherham uh, and I think uh, they were 21 or 22 matches unbeaten going into that. And uh, I don't think anybody sort of picked uh, Accrington for uh, for a result. Um, I, I thought it was going to end up a, a nothing, nothing. But, it, you know, with that goal late in the second half, uh, it was a, a well-deserved win and, and really sort of, um, uh, really, it sort of kicked them on because they've, they've, they have been playing with a lot of confidence, as I say. And um, I, think, I think it's going to be a tough match come Saturday. I've looked at your form and so obviously the last time we spoke, it was it was a top of the table clash. I think we were first year and second at the time and it felt like a, a really big win. Obviously, we've kind of stayed around there. I know there's games in hand and stuff like that for other sides around there, but currently we're technically second. You're currently in 11, so you, you have dropped a little bit. There is reasons behind that. And whilst the current form has been really good um, and you've definitely stopped conceding goals, you've had a really bizarre set of results actually since we last played. I looked through a few of them. Um, lost 4-0 to Burton, beat Fleetwood 5-1. You beat Ipswich, Charlton and Lincoln away from home. Charlton and Lincoln away from home, sorry, Ipswich at home. Uh, you lost 5-1 to Oxford. You lost 5-1 to Port Vale in the FA Cup and lost to Cheltenham. And if you add in the Rotherham result there, that is a really bizarre set of results. We lost to uh, Oldham in the uh, in the in the cup match too, and they were at the bottom of the league too. Um, I you know it's um, it's not it's not that he doesn't put out a strong squad. Uh, it's just that the at the time of some of those results, as I said, the um, they they if they were passing back to the goalkeeper, the ball might have just gone to the side or whatever it just that every mistake was magnified and and everything that they did uh, every there was no luck at all it was all bad luck and and you know when you're going when it's, it seems like you're playing football uphill because you just can't get anywhere and and uh, the ball was ending up in the back of the net once it got to two or three goals and they lose in the shape you could see that you could see the players uh just the shoulders dropping especially you know, if it got to two nothing, um, the 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 players were sort of down, and I think that was a really uh, tough spell a, a spell because um, it disappointed the the coaching staff because the, the players seemed like they were giving up a little bit. Uh, they've really they've really got uh, meetings, they had player meetings, and they've really sort of uh, got back to the basics and uh, and and really started building from the back out as far as playing solid defensively and they said you know cut out the mistakes and then we'll start getting some results and 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 that's what's happened and you can tell they're playing with they're playing with confidence and they've had some uh, you know with the results we've had um and the lineup they've been using um uh, harry pell has not been able to get into the lineup as starting lineup the last uh, two or three uh, matches uh because of the uh, the players out there players that were giving a chance like liam coyle um, they were they were getting the opportunity to play it, and they're really grabbing it by the, you know, by the brass ring, and they're really really uh, making it tough uh, for the manager to sit them out. So we got players that are hungry and now playing with confidence and uh, and uh, listening to the managers, and and that's a good combination to to have. There's one 
big talking point probably through, I mean, we've discussed it off air. We discussed it, I think, last time we, we actually chatted. It's came to a resolution, but last time we spoke, there were issues with what many people would have classed as your main man, which was Dion Charles. He was basically anchoring a move away from the club. It seemed that the cause him some unrest. He has moved to Bolton for, as a quote, a seven-figure fee, I think it was, or a six-figure fee, sorry. It was quoted. How did that scenario end up playing out? And, and is it better that he's no longer a Stanley player? I think it is. And it was it was one of those things that they really did. did I think it's reported to somewhere between 300 and 400,000 pounds that they got. Uh, which is not really what he was worth, but um, it was more a question of, of uh, you know, resolving the issue and getting rid. He was really sort of a distraction. Um, at the early part, when he was sitting out, he was more of a distraction. Um, but the team started adjusting and playing without him. And uh, it gave opportunities for other players to come in, like a young Tommy Lee that uh, they signed from Wagner Regis. Um, he's, he's really sort of... Uh, uh, he's one to watch. He's a, he's a kid. He's a kid with a bright future, and I think he wouldn't have got the opportunity to play without uh, if Dean Charles had been around. I, he wasn't happy with Dean Charles, and you could see it in his play. But what he he wanted to move to a, a so-called bigger club, uh, and a Bolton or bigger club in name, and because they got a bigger stadium, bigger history. But at the moment, I don't think they're a bigger club on the pitch, and. Um, um, you know, he, uh, he and apparently he's only there for a few days and he had to apologize for small tweets that he that he uh, he sent out a, a while ago. And then he, his reaction, apparently, when he was subbed the other night uh, after 60 minutes wasn't uh, a positive. I guess his body language wasn't that positive as he left the pitch. So I, I don't I don't think I would like to say the grass is always greener on the other side. And I think he's going to find that out. Quite an interesting one with Dion Charles because I think, and I mean this with all due respect, and, and you may agree with me, you may disagree, but I think the way Accrington are as a football club, if you get an asset, then nine times out of ten it is quite hard to hold on to them if you get good money. And, and the player who leaves seems to have a lot of respect for what Accrington did, for what Coleman did and, and what the club did and the fans. You wish them well because you understand that they're going to maybe a club in the championship or so on and so forth. And it's all very mutual. It's all very nice. And everyone knows how it works. With Dion Charles, it, it didn't seem to work out like that at all, really. I mean, why did he become unhappy? Was there any real rhyme or reason behind why? Well, I think there's a couple of combination of things. He got his head turned by going to uh, uh, called up for Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. and, and there's rumours that he was uh, talked to by other players saying, you know, what do you do in Akron Stanley? You can pay for a bigger club. And then he also got Joey Barton's uh, uh, agent uh, as his new agent. Um, and uh, there's, so there's a combination of a few things there that, uh, and he he agreed that he he, he would sign a contract in, and they, he was told by the club, if you sign the contract, um, uh, we'll move you if, a, if an offer comes in. Uh, because he was a million dollar, at least a seven figure player. And they said, you know, we'll move you to another club. Uh, he reneged on signing that. Uh, that he went back on his word and said he wasn't going to sign when he agreed to. Um, and the club had no option but to sit him out. And uh, so when you get when you get a player that's not happy, and as I say, it's as far as I can recall, it's the first that I can think of that where a player's done this to a club like Stanley because players going to into he, he got a break from Southport. Uh, brought up and got developed. He wouldn't have been in Northern Ireland squad if it wasn't for uh, John and Jimmy, Jimmy, uh, and the coaching staff. So, and he just uh, he really turned the back on the team, which uh, didn't sit well with the fans. So, I think he couldn't have had a future with Stanley because he would have had to apologize straight away and come back, uh, but he didn't. And uh, when he did that, the fans wouldn't have accepted him back, and that's very unusual because. Uh, Stanley supporters get behind uh, a, a player who goes gives his heart for the club. They'll follow him till uh, you know his end of his career, wherever he goes, and they'll always stand behind him. And uh, he he he's hurt a lot of people by his actions. And uh, uh, as a player, I wish him well. I think as a person, he made the wrong decision. Yeah, I mean, it did seem, and I'm sure Bolton fans listening to this will say, oh, "Well, of course, Bolton are bigger and." 
Yeah, obviously a lot of the time that I've followed football, Bolton have been in or around the top two divisions. But on paper at the moment, if you give me Bolton away or Accrington away, there wouldn't be much of a difference. So at least on a level par in terms of where they're playing and where the position is in the league at the moment. And for him to have such an anchoring for a move and to be so frustrated being at Stanley to make essentially in football in terms of sideways move and also because of his attitude or seeming attitude, to have done a club at Akron and Stanley out of a best part of 600,000, because he was quoted at a million, I think, for a while, and maybe 750, say. That must rankle quite a bit. Well, I think it's, it, 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 it hurts a club like Stanley because mm-hmm. uh, that kind of money goes into the, you know, that could go towards the uh, uh, the building of a, uh, a roof over the way in. Uh, I mean, that's that kind of money is, it just doesn't come along that often to... Uh, uh, to a club like Stanley. And, and that's the thing is you develop a player and if he's got the potential, there's other clubs are going to come in. But I don't, I think gone are the days where the, the club would have to sell him for whatever the fee, whatever was offered. Uh, they can say, no, he's under contract. You want to pay for him. You're going to have to pay a fair market value. Uh, and, and that's a lot to do with Andy Alt giving the players extended contracts instead of year to year. Um, and then you have to rebuild every season. And this now you've got players under contract. And if somebody wants them, uh, like a Ross Sykes, uh, you know, I think he's developing into a top-notch centre-back in League One and has a potential to go higher. Um, and he's under contract. If they want to come in and buy him, they're going to have to pay. It's no longer they'll, they'll go for two or 300,000 pounds. They're going to have to pay seven figures to get our top players now. With situations like that, because I suppose it's different for a club like Sunderland, especially in League One anyway, maybe it'd be, we understand this maybe more in the Premier League when we've had the Hendersons and the Pickfords and whatnot. Now people are looking at Dan Neal higher up the, the, higher up the chain as well. But with Akron and Stanley, it's almost like when you develop a player, they're instantly linked elsewhere. That can get frustrating because it's hard to hold on to the kind of a, a love for someone sometimes because they've gone within six months of performing well. In the fan base, though, is there quite an understanding of like that's the way the club's got to work? So you never get you never get too attached to a player, if that makes sense. Well, it, they yeah they and they'll get attached to a player, but they won't they won't it won't hold them back from uh, supporting him and wishing him well. And there's been lots of people that have said they're not happy with Dion Charles's position that he took, but have said they wished him well at, at his next career. I think that's just the way Stanley fans are, is that they. They want to. They want to see them. Uh, the players do well, and and uh, like as I say, I use the example of, of Ross Sykes. But you've got Tommy Lee, and you've got uh, Liam Coyle. You've got these young players that are given a, a, a chance to uh, play and develop in a, in a Stanley team. And um, if uh, John Coleman said he would never stand in anybody going to uh, to a higher level, um, uh, and I think that's uh, uh, Stanley's. A, 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 I think the fans look at the club as a as a stepping stone for players to uh, to prove themselves and to go on to better, uh, bigger, and better things. And um, yeah, we don't. We know where if we're going to get a top notch player, uh, the chances are that he's going to play out his contract, or if he's going to he's going to be sold. Uh, and that's just it's a it's a revenue stream for Accrington. Uh, and it's an important revenue stream, and they've got to. It's part of the business plan, and they uh, they've got they, and people in in and around the club accept that. Obviously, from a fan's perspective, you're not going to know the exact answer. To this is only Andy Holt, really, or people around the board of directors that will understand this. But because I've been in this division for quite a while, it's not. It's maybe not the dream that it was when they first got promoted. Now people see them as a legitimately difficult place to go, a club that can push for up and around the playoffs. It's sometimes strength of squad in terms of numbers that can affect you where you sometimes fall out, which we discussed about um, on the last podcast, falling out the playoffs. But, but what is Accrington's next step when they've invested this stuff? How can you start pushing towards maybe even potentially going higher in the championship? Because now that you've been here that long, you've, I mean, it's a few times you've been closed. You've got to start be looking at that now, surely. Well, I think that's it's it's uh, there was high hopes going into the season because of mm-hmm. the uh, of the players that they signed, uh, and uh, we ran into uh, injury problems. And uh, one of the top players on on our team has been out for most of the season, Joe Pritchard, and uh, he's a really exciting player. Uh, and I think uh, you know, with the form they went through, it's um, it's sort of um, 
uh, I think dulled a lot of people's opinion that they could go up this year. But there was high hopes for a, a possible playoff p- a push. Um, and I mean, if we get into some form in second half of the season, you know, we could challenge for that number six spot. But I think realistically, you know, uh, I think we we look at this season as, as sort of developing some of the players and uh, and and take another run at it next year. I, the goal is obviously is not only to be established league one team, but if you can get promoted. And uh, John uh, Coleman has said he's got another promotion in him. And uh, if they go up, I think they'd give it a good shot. I don't think they'd, they would sell their future uh, or go into debt just to try and stay in the, season, in the championship for an extra season or two. I think they would go up there, enjoy it, and, uh, and do the best they could. And the Stanley, the Stanley teams have never been uh, accused of, uh, of rolling over. So if, they, if, they, uh, if it was for uh, desire, they would stay in the championship if they got there. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule against them. Not, uh, you know, I think they got a really good chance in the next couple of years while Jimmy and John and Jimmy are around to get, get a promotion. And uh, uh, I think it would be a tremendous story uh, to me to see Stanley promoted. I, I, in fact, I would, I would, I would wager a bet that this would be a bigger story than Leicester winning the, the uh, Premier League that Stanley get promoted to the championship. I think that would be a, a, a feel good story for, for football fans uh, uh, around the, around the UK. And I don't want to, um, I never thought I'd say this because there's history with Sunderland and Wickham. We have to be honest here. We're not the best of friends, but clubs like Wickham, have to probably be like an inspiration to clubs at Accrington because if Wickham can do it, there's absolutely no reason that Accrington can't do exactly the same. Yeah, I think that and Wickham they they're they're obviously not on a, a, a huge budget, but they they certainly got uh, they get players in and uh, I mean they've signed they got Sam Volks playing for them this year that mm-hmm. uh, an old Burnley player and he was a a, a, a really good striker with Burnley and he's scoring some goals this year. Uh, yeah, they just seem to do. Uh, they seem to do well. Uh, you know, they've got a, a really good manager. Um, and uh, yeah, Wickham are, uh, are somebody that would say, you, Stanley looks at them and say, well, if they can do it, why can't we? Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the, the, the team itself, I want to go back to the, the Dean Child situation. I think, obviously, John Coleman's, from what I can see, you'll know this better, but all of the formations slightly, it seems. You mentioned about him playing with a four at the back, but then he's played with, two recently behind Kobe Bishop in like a 3-4-2-1 almost rather than what you would usually play, which is like a 3-5-2 or a 5-3-2, a three at the back formation, essentially. However, the one thing with that is I've noticed since November, there's only one time you've scored more than one goal. So it is January. Uh, are Accrington fans looking for moves to be made in the striking department to help out Kobe Bishop a little bit? Yeah, and, and uh, it was... It's really disappointing because last week they had a player that they uh, really thought that was going to uh, sign with the club. In fact, they had a hotel room booked for him and everything. And um, he uh, was a, a, a striker from Norwich. Um, and, you know, and that says a lot when, when a club like Hackington can be in the market or be in the running from it for a striker that's with a Premier League club. I think just that in itself is a, is a, is a big statement. Uh, but unfortunately, he went somewhere else, and it's probably down to uh, getting a little bit more in his wage packet, uh, which is unfortunate. But you know, Stanley can't compete with some of these clubs for on their wages, uh, and that was a disappointment. And we've got Mumbongo that was uh, on loan from Burnley; he's out for the season. Um, now, I you know it, it, they've tried having, like you said, of playing some people in behind. Um, and I think they, you know, if they don't sign a striker, you may see a guy like Harry Pell or Tommy Lee uh, play as a sort of number 10 role, not just say necessarily two strikers, but playing off of uh, Colby Bishop a, a bit, you know. And uh, both Harry Pell and, um, and uh, Tommy Lee uh, can score, and they proved it at this level. Uh, so if they, they normally play them in the midfield. But if we get to, uh, when uh, Ethan Hamilton, you got Matt Butcher, and if Joe Pritchard comes back, you're going to have a lot of players in the midfield that can afford to move a Harry Pell or a, or a Tommy Lee up to uh, uh, up to play off of Colby Bishop. Talked about Colby Bishop there. We haven't really touched on him fully, but 
he obviously came from, I think, Leamington Spa. I remember, I think the first, well, the second time I went to Accrington, the first time the game actually finished because it wasn't raining. It was actually a nice summer's day um, or summer's night, should I say, as I was kind of discussing off air before. But I think that was his first game. I think he scored a penalty that day. But he scored consistently for Accrington. With Dion Charles now gone and no striker yet in, how important is Cobby Bishop to Accrington this season? Well, oh, yeah, obviously, he's very important because, uh, uh, and there's been no... But there's been no offers. I confirmed this last week with uh, inside the club uh, that there's been no offers as of last Wednesday uh, for any of our players, which is good because I think Colby Bishop uh, and you look at Toby Savin, our goalkeeper, and and as I've mentioned, Ross Sykes, there are players that could go to a higher level and, and uh, a bigger club. Um, it's um, he, he's really you can tell when his play that he's matured in 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 the sense that. His overall game, he can head the ball. I mean, that a goal he scored against MK Dons on a set piece. He, he headed the ball on the 18-yard uh, line from at the edge of the box and, and put it in the top corner. Um, and his hold-up play is really good. Uh, he can turn. He can shoot the ball. He knows where the net is. So his game is really rounded into a complete game where uh, he, he's attractive to other teams because he can he – can, if you want him to score from a set piece, he can. Uh, he can hold up the play, as I say. So he's got a lot going for him. I just hope, hopefully, we can keep hold of him, and then we'll just, uh, you know, get somebody to play off him this season. Are you surprised to not be more interested in him? Because I, I actually am. He seems to be maybe because he plays for a quote unquote unfashionable club. But if Dean Charles can make a move, I always sort of look to, to Colby Bishop, if I'm honest, out of the two of them. He always seemed to be slightly more prolific, and I haven't checked the figures on that. But I'm really surprised clubs are not in from. Everyone's wanting a striker in January, aren't they? Well, I think, you know, I know Peterborough have been watching him, and they 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 were sort of uh, put in a, a very low ball offer at the end of the August uh, transfer window, uh, which was really... I think again, trying to come in and thinking that Stanley will take an offer when they, you know when they don't, and, and these days, as I said, they don't have to. Um, and that, so that I, I don't know if they'll wait towards the end of the window and see, but there was interest from them, but no offers come in from them. But I hope he stays because he's a really, he really appreciates and is is loyal to the club that uh, found him in the lower leagues and have developed him. And he's his attitude is uh, is one that's opposite to uh, to Dion Charles is that he wants the club to be uh, to be rewarded for the work they put into him. Regarding your team itself, that's going to line up on Saturday. I don't think you're the only team, but like many teams, COVID issues recently. Coyle was sent off on Saturday, so I believe he'll be suspended. And the backup goalkeeper, James Trafford, who started this season as your number one, obviously Savins came in and replaced him. Looks like he's been recalled by Man City. He's going to be sent on to Bolton. I think everyone's squad is stretched for numerous reasons, COVID being maybe one of the main ones, not least our own. But are there any selection worries for Accrington on Saturday? Um, I think it's going to be a similar squad to what we saw against MK Dons. I think Pell will come in for, for Coyle. Uh, and and uh, I think you'll get. I think we'll still see uh, O'Sullivan on the wing. Um, and I think he's he's a player that's uh, uh, to me is um, he's a good he's a good player off the bench. Um, and I think if we get say Seamus Keneally back, uh, who anchors the midfield, then I would say that you would probably see a guy like O'Sullivan drop to the bench, and then you'd have a midfield of Butcher. Uh, uh, Pritchard, uh, Ethan Hamilton is a strong player and got quality. Uh, and then we've got Joe Pritchard to come back. So I think this, but for this weekend, I think you'll see this, the same lineup against MK Dons, but uh, uh, Pell in for, uh, uh, for Coyle. And I think you'll see the same formation where it's the, uh, well, Tommy Lee and uh, McConville will, will play just behind uh, uh, Bishop. And I think you'll see Tommy Lee and McConville switch sides uh, during the match. And Tommy Lee is is he's another player with uh, a long throw in his in, in his bag, and and I think from set pieces and any any throw-ins in in the in the in the in your half is, is going to go into the box, and I think that's going to that's that's where we seem to create a lot of problems for for our teams is from set pieces, corners, uh, throw-ins, and uh, free kicks, and uh, hopefully that will happen on Saturday. 
find I touched on James Crawford there. I find um, that situation quite interesting. Obviously, it's maybe maybe it's not worth discussing a player that's not going to be involved whatsoever on Saturday, but nonetheless, I will. Um, he started the season number one for people unaware, and I'm sure there's plenty you are. Obviously, James Trafford comes from the same side that Callum Doyle, who's playing with us at the moment, Man City's kind of academy team. He came through, made some great saves. I think he played at the stadium light, made some good saves, looked like one of the better goalkeepers in the league. And yet he's actually going on loan to Bolton because he can't get in past Toby Savin. What what happened there? Did he just fall out of favour or did Savin just perform overly well? Well, I think there were there were there was a stretch there where both keepers were struggling a, a bit. And uh um, you know, our defensive play overall, I think you could tell Trafford's very, very strong in the box, very, uh, got a lot of experience in, in taking command for a, such a young player. Uh, but last year when um, um, Baxter came in, Toby Savin didn't handle it well and, and was sort of, and it was a bit, I would say immature, might not be the right word, but he just didn't handle that, that, that well. This year when uh, Trafford came in, he, he dug down and he, he worked hard and uh, proved himself to get back in the squad and really has is, is, is kept uh, Trafford on the bench simply because of his good play. Um, he deserves to be in and it's hard for Trafford coming because he wants to obviously wants to play and, and he'll go to Bolton. But I think um, Savin is in there uh, on merit and uh, it's just to, just because he's played really really well and and he's, he's a top quality keeper and he's, he's still only young I think he's 21 or something like that he's still got a he's got a bright future in front of him is that another sort of stream for Akron and obviously we've talked about you bringing in players from non-league and selling them on at different prices and then hopefully eventually at some point you'll get to a point where you don't need to do that and you, you'll start pushing further up the league and you kind of get in there really but is that another stream for them? And obviously, Toby Savin came, I think he originally started at Southport, but he's basically came through at Accrington, sorry. Ross Sykes, exactly the same. Um, yeah. I'm actually quite ignorant to this and don't know if you have an academy. I'm sure you have some sort of thing going on with it. But is that a new stream? Because you're bringing through young players kind of a little bit more regularly, I've noticed. Yeah, we've got, uh, there's a fellow that's actually an a, a ex-Burnley player uh, and played at Stanley, Ashley Oskins who's head of the academy and recruitment. And uh, he's bringing in some, some quality players. They've got a really, they started the, the U23 team uh, uh, recently, and uh, they've got Jed Brennan running that. Uh, so they are, they know it's a, uh, it's a, it's a positive gen, uh, revenue stream for the club and they're going to develop players. And you get one or two players that make the team or you get players that are sold on. But it's it's part of their business model now, and um, yeah, it's, these they they've got a lot of contacts to John and Jimmy and uh, uh, throughout the non-league, and they'll get calls. You should check this player out, and 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 they give them a chance, and 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 we're do, they've done it with like you say the players that you mentioned, and now another one they found another one in Tommy Lee. Uh, he's he's come from Bognor Regis into uh, League One. And you watch him play on Saturday, and I'll tell you, you you would you would think he was a seasoned veteran. He's really he's really uh, taken to it like a duck to water, and uh, uh, it, it's um, it's an opportunity for players to uh, to come and prove themselves. And uh, uh, they're developing players, and yeah, I think it's they're they're uh, they're doing a good job in, in 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 finding and developing players. And and I say if they go on, they just want to be rewarded for their investment in that player. Funny there, you mentioned Tommy Lee, and obviously I'm, I'm very disappointed it's not like Tommy Lee spelt in the same way as the actor, but nonetheless, he started at Baffin's Milton Rovers only two years ago in Bognor Regis, then to Accrington and Stanley, but you, you keep finding those gems, don't you? Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah and, and as I say, that's, I have a lot to do with the, the reputation of the coaching staff, uh, because we don't have a scouting department. They can't go, but in this day and age, you, you know, if somebody sees a player... You can get video on the player pretty quick, uh, and uh, they've got such a, a, a good reputation. And being from Liverpool, there's lots of those uh, uh, scousers who'll phone them up and say, "Jimmy, we got a player down in Bognor Regis. Go and take a look." And uh, Jimmy Bell will go off and have a look, and uh, lo and behold, they'll bring a player in, and they seem to do it every season. And uh, it's uh, it's a very important part of where Stanley are at because of the these players they find 
hidden gems. And as I say, if they can go on to bigger and better things and make some money for the club, everybody comes out a winner. On the, my club, of course, which is always interesting week on week. Um, last week, I'm flying high and thinking we're going to easily win the league. This week, I'm thinking, ah, playoffs again. But you faced us once this season, probably seen us maybe not at our best, but when we were in good form. Um, in the main, Sunderland have been impressive recently. However, the table shows we're going to have got five games in hand on us, which is a lot, but there's still only games in hand, not points guaranteed. Yeah. Rotherham have got two games in hand on us. Wickham are very close to us. It's tight at the top is basically what I'm saying. Um, from what you've seen of Sunderland, is this the season Sunderland go up or do we once again have to make do with the playoffs and keep our fingers crossed? Well, we did uh, on our podcast across the pitch, uh, we we had a sort of a, a, uh, a roundtable discussion between our three uh, co-hosts. And we picked the teams that we wanted to go, uh, we would expect to go up. And the one team that was unanimous for all three of us that was going to go up this year is Sunderland. Uh, I think we feel that you know, this is the, the the season, even though I know you had a, a, a blip uh, against Lincoln. But, um, uh, and Wigan, you've got to win, like you said, you've got to win those games in hand. They don't mean anything until, unless you, uh, unless you get some points. Um I think it's a three-horse race. Rotherham, I, I'm very impressed with them. Uh, Wigan, yeah, they they hit they played us when we were at a, a low level. Um, but I think those three teams, and I, I I'm picking uh, uh, you and Rotherham to go up automatically, and uh, we'll you know hopefully that will happen for you guys. That's why you're always welcome back on the show, Tony. That's why you see. <laughs> Uh, final question is always, I'm sure you know it's going to come, but predictions for Saturday? Well, I think recent form, looking at, you know, looking at the at, uh, the table and, and what the results for both teams, um, I'll take a draw. I'd take a draw right now. And I think it's going to be low scoring, Graham, because just the way Stanley's been playing recently. And uh, if we can stop uh, Ross Stewart, uh, you know, if we can keep him, down to a goal or less, I think uh, we've got a chance for a draw. I'd, I'd, I'd snap your hand off. We could win 2-1. Uh, but there's a good possibility that you guys could win 2-1. So it's, I think it's going to be a close game. And, uh, yeah, I think just with recent form, um, I'll, I'll go with a 1-1. I'm going to go with a 1-1 as well. I'll be honest, I'm the eternal optimist when it comes to life in general I'm the eternal pessimist when it comes to Sunderland Association Football Club but there's reasons for that um, and I think that's possibly the third week in a row I've agreed with the guest on what the score was going to be but I'm going to take 1-1 one, one. But, but Tony as always um, thanks so much for joining always nice to catch up with you mate I'm pleased to see you doing well and, and fans are back in the stadium so hopefully you, you get to come over soon yeah well I've got, uh, got tickets booked for next uh, season and Excellent come over and uh, I'm fingers crossed that we can get back because I've missed, uh, I, although I enjoy watching on iFollow, I certainly miss the live action and uh, the sounds, the smell, the, you know, everything that's associated with being a uh, uh, pitch side. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, to getting uh, getting back over. But uh, yeah, I think it'd be a good match Saturday. I'll put a, a, a good, clean, fair contest. And uh, I'll, yeah, let's uh, let's enjoy the day. Before I let anyone go, if you are listening to this, if you're going to Akron on Saturday, which currently I am, unless COVID gets me, which hopefully it doesn't, um, the butter and potato pie Akron is my favourite pie in the whole of League One. So if you are there and you are thinking, which pie do I get? Potato and butter is my 100% recommendation. I've had four in total in two visits. And they do, yeah, the Clayton Park pies, they do, and they're excellent pies. Uh, and also... I like a, a pint of the Racky Ale, which is a, a brewery, bowl and brewery out of Clitheroe. And uh, you can't go wrong with a pint of Racky Ale and, and, a, and, a, and a pie. And hopefully Andy Holt, because I've advertised all of your stuff there, I get a bit of a commission, mate. Thanks very much. Okay. <laughs> nice to see you, Graham. Take care of yourself. You too, bud.